uh, like the graffiti artists do, and Julia is a street artist and an art therapist in the rest of her life. Next slide. <laughs> and so here you can see I uh, love this little kid doing, next slide, the Black Power salute. <laughs> And again, we'll just kind of run through these slides and you can see um, the next slide, the, uh, uh, the sort of the banner slowly filling in, this big banner slowly filling in. Next. People, the stencils were clipped to the banner. Next. And adults participated in this as well as kids. Next. Next. I think this is great too because you know there's a transgressiveness and a power to the can of spray paint that these kids definitely felt. Next. Next. And the colors that this is the first year um, and resist was a big slogan uh, right in the wake of Trump's election and the colors of kind of red and black and gray had this very angry tone. Next. And here you can see it filling up. Next. 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 And one of the things Julia said that she really loved about doing this project was the opportunity to talk with kids while they were um, working on the banner and like talking about, well, what does it mean to resist and why are we doing this and why did you choose this symbol and just engaging in dialogue. Next. <laughs> Here we are at the conclusion. And then the next slide, you can see how it turned out in the parade. Um, next. Okay. And that then obviously that's Julia on the left. Next. So then the second year, a year had passed, a lot had happened. Um, one of the things that had happened was, as you know, the Me Too movement. A second thing that has happened is that Trump has really dismantled our environmental protection agency in a truly frightening way. So I asked Julia if she'd be willing to do a banner again and what she wanted to do, and she decided that this year she wanted to do, and this was just this October, um, respect her, meaning respect the voices of women, but also respect the planet, respect Earth. So that was her starting point, and she, if we go to the next slide, she chose a very different palette, um, kind of earth colors, ocean, air. Next slide. And really encouraged girls, in particular, I mean, she encouraged everyone, but it was great to see girls out there doing the, their graffiti thing. Next slide. Next. And again, there's this opportunity for interaction one-on-one, -on -one, but it also was very much a family activity. Um, next. What was the period of Took about three hours. Next. And it's, it's so great to see it fill up and uh, I was talking with Ken about it, and he said he thought the really powerful thing about it is that there's this individuality and chaos, and people are doing their own thing, but it kind of coheres artistically into a pretty powerful, crisp, graphic statement at the end. So next, this kind of messiness um, is transformed into the message. Next, it's like the messiness of energy. Voice. Next. So here you can see that on this occasion, um, Julia revealed it during the festival. Next. And here she is the next day. So we have our parade the next day. So she marched in, in the big parade the next day in a Wonder Woman costume, just so there was no misunderstanding about what respect her means. Um, next. And she actually marched with the Somerville Women's Commission, which was pretty great. And it gave the Women's Commission, who probably wouldn't have had the greatest signs, you know, this really great banner to march with. Okay, um, next. 
And the resist banner that she created the first year was used by a group called Indivisible Somerville, which is a grassroots political organizing group, and it's now their banner. They can use it for whatever actions they're doing. Next. Okay, so the next artist is Cedric Douglas, and um, I had done a big project with him in Arlington that was a an oral history project with portraits of local small business people, um, which if you came to my talk last year, you might have seen. Um, and I, Cedric is really a wonderful person um, and a wonderful artist, and I had been wanting to get him involved with Honk, and so this year he, he did get involved with Honk. He's Julia's partner. And he came when she was, he'd never been to Hunk, and he came the first year that she did her banner project and was blown away. He was like, oh, okay, now I see why he liked this festival so much. And so he agreed to, to do something this year it's called the Rose Memorial. So next slide. This is Cedric. He's a really accomplished street artist. This is from a gallery exhibition that he did where he showed some of his fine art work as well as his activist work. I just love this portrait. Um, next slide. But usually he's doing street art, and I wish we could get him to Wollongong to work in your festival here, and he would love to come to Australia. Next slide. This is a piece that he just finished with Julia. They did it collaboratively right near our house in Cambridge. Next slide. And that's the focal point, this hideous garage they were given to transform in a street art festival. Next. Um, but as a pretty young man, he actually, he was arrested for graffiti as a 16-year-old when he was trying to beautify a rundown um, playground near his house. And it, it kind of stunned him that he, he was trying to express himself creatively. And so as he got older, he was trying to figure out ways that he could express himself creatively and have it be very positive and then have this community engagement aspect. And he entrepreneurially started this thing called the Uptrop that went to different neighborhoods and did art activities that were meant to uh, talk about community and how can you make your community better. Next. And while he was doing that, he started something called the Street Memorial Project. Next slide. Um, this is, he used the graphic design. He, is a, he has a degree in graphic design from Mass College of Art, which is um, one of the better, best art schools in our area. And so he's really familiar with professional graphic design. He used the language of street signage to create here a memorial for a young black man who was run over by the police. Um, and this was put up in the spot where this happened in Miami at Miami Basil, which is the big, one of the big art sale events in the US. Um, next slide. And here you can see from this gallery exhibition a range of these street art memorial um, signs that he made for different black people killed by police. Next. So he did a residency at Emerson University in Boston and um, focused on developing this idea of memorializing black people killed by police. And he actually asked me if I would help with some of the research. He started out with the idea, the statistic, that 300 black people have been killed by police in the last five years. And I discovered doing the research that there actually is no way to do the research. There's no master database kept by the government about this kind of killing. So it turns out, though, that the Washington Post has taken it upon itself to create a database. And so we realized that the number was well over a thousand in the last five years, and that's only, and it's really close to three years, and that's only what they have been able to discover. So, um, so that was pretty amazing and um, impactful. And an example, I think, of what an artist in residence at a university can do for an activist artist, give him the space and time to develop not only his practice, but also his research. So Cedric designed this tag. Um, Eric is one of more than a thousand black people who has been killed in the United States in the last, well, we went back and forth between three and five years. I think we ended up with five just to cover ourselves. 
this rose represents Eric Gardner's life. So he, next slide, there's another example of a label. Um, and these are sort of based on the toe tags that you would find in the morgue. Um, and we found photos online that he used for the tags. Um, and he did an action at Emerson, um, but he didn't have a huge audience because it was unannounced and rainy, and actually Ken uh, played music for that. Um, but he went out on the street in, in downtown Boston and handed out roses. So I asked him if he would bring this project to Hunt, where I knew there would be a ton of people. So next slide. So we bought him um, 350 roses with the thorns removed. <laughs> Next slide. And he set up an area with the tags. Next slide. Invited the public to attach the tags to roses. Next slide. And here you can see some of the tags with attached to the roses. Next slide. And then he had this cart, which um, is a really interesting cart. I, I have mixed feelings about how this works aesthetically because it's sort of got this slightly carnival aspect or food cart aspect, but he also means it to be a sort of, um, it's used in a, a procession at the end that's almost like a funeral procession. So it's an interesting choice um, on his part. But uh, on this cart, um, next slide, are, were a variety of things that he used to prompt conversation and get into dialogue with people. Um, next slide. Including, this is from Boston, but this is a tactic he's developed of having people fill out these large surveys. So when is it okay to shoot someone? Um, goes from never ever to with a super soaker. Um, <laughs> next slide. And also, he developed this tape um, years ago to make available to people for actions that they might be doing. Like, he printed up quite a lot of it and was like, just take it, use it for whatever you want. And these come from a couple of famous incidents where um, black people were killed by police. One um, young man saying, don't shoot, don't shoot. And of course, this, I can't breathe, someone who was in a chokehold. So, Next slide. So basically Cedric was there to talk to people, very kind of low key, just get their opinions and, and ask for their reactions and talk with them about the reality of this project. You know, um, Somerville is a pretty white community and we're all aware that we live within white privilege and so it's uh, impactful just to come up against this statistic and these faces and a person of color who's you know, talking about something that people are pretty silent about. And of course, for our festival, um, you know, we work closely with the police, the Somerville police, and they're around on detail, and they help us with our parade, and the mayor comes, and we were a little worried about would there be uh, any pushback, but we heard n no, nothing but positive comments. So, next slide. Here you can see he's at his table just talking. Next. People reading the tags. Next. All right, this is just a little, I took a series of photos of this family, of their reaction, looking at the tags. So we could just run through this. Because you're at a street festival, basically, and you're handed a rose, and you're like, what is this? So, next. And you read it. Next. And you talk to your kids about it. Next. And your kids start to pay attention even though they're eating ice cream. Next. Next. And, you know, you cry. Next slide. And so there were a lot of moments like that, these sort of private moments as people read and digested these tanks in a public space. And you can see, you know, other people might have no idea this is going on. Next. So then um, around six, so this is this has been going started, we started around two. So around six, 
Cedric met up with this great uh, band that's based in Providence that's very activist. Um, extraordinary rendition band, or wonderful, very theatrical band, um, to do a procession. So, next slide. And this is Julia from the Banner Project. She got dressed in her kind of funereal clothes to participate in the procession. Next. And we just did a sort of second line funeral style parade down, this is Elm Street. Next. Next. And along the way, Cedric's mother participated in this. He was so happy. Apparently this was like the first action that he had done that she participated in. And I, I didn't realize at the time how important that was to him, but, or even, like, so that was a really, a great thing that Hawk was able to give back to him. So as the procession went along, she and other volunteers handed out the roses with their tags. Next. 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 And then we were making our way to the stage where the full band was going to perform their set. Next. And I love this because some of Cedric's, I don't have a slide, but some of his artworks, his murals feature a little child who's painted a huge imaginary, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex or something. So, next. Um, the plan was for the band to have a moment of silence before they play next and then kind of go into their raucous performance. So that was the Rose Memorial. Um, okay, so next slide. Um, this is the last project I'm going to talk about, so I'm good for time, that's great. Um, Nora Valdez is an argent artist from Argentina, um, and I asked her if she would collaborate with a really wonderful activist group called the Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Advocacy Coalition, or MIRA, um, and build on a project that she had already started called the Suitcase Project. So, next slide. As a fine artist, um, Nora's done a lot of sculpture. She, she loves to work with stone, and she's um, taken journey and home as a theme, I think because of her own, she travels quite a bit between her original home and the US and other places around the world. Next. So these are little sculptures incorporating the idea of home. Next. And voyage, this boat. Next. But she got a grant to do a really large project where she um, created these storytelling suitcases, these sort of autobiographical suitcases, um, with a, a lot of the participants were young people, were teenagers through um, a community-based arts program in Boston called Urbano, but as it was a way for people to talk about where they came from, where their parents came from, where their grandparents came from, and put mementos inside these cases, and she did over a hundred of these. Next slide. And they've been exhibited in various spaces, including the big Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Next slide. And I, I so I had seen this, um, and that was why I thought perhaps she could do something on this theme for Hawk. So next slide. So <laughs> put out we put out a call for donations for suitcases, and the uh, Salvation Army was great. They gave us a whole bunch of. Um, suitcases to use. And this young woman on the right is Beza. She's um, originally from Turkey and part of the staff of Mira, and she really made this project happen. She was fantastic. You'll see her in all the pictures. She's like, at Where's Waldo? You'll see her in all the pictures. And she brought a huge, great energy to the project. Next. So, um, 
Nora did the storytelling suitcase project in a kind of retreat with the Mira staff people outside of the festival, before the festival, but then the suitcases were exhibited at Hunk at Mira's table, where Mira could do whatever kind of outreach they wanted to. So this, we don't usually allow tabling at our festival, but this created a, an event where they could table and have all of their materials. And um, next slide. And also something engaging for the public to look at. Next slide. Next one. And so I think it really helped them and supported their organization and outreach, their organizing and outreach work because they could talk with people about the suitcases and what did they mean as well as um, hand out their literature. Next. Next. Oh, by the way, could you go back for one second? You can see Julia's banner project back there. So it's sort of like this whole street was full. Okay, next project. I mean, next one. Next. Next. And, and then for the public, using stencils again, we asked people to pick a stencil, stencil a suitcase, and then the suitcases were available for the parade the next day. And Mira um, organized people to be in the parade, but also anyone from the public who stenciled a suitcase would be totally welcome to join Mira's um, group in the parade and speak up for what they, for the, you know, the atrocious treatment. This is in the wake of, you know, Trump putting children in cages and deporting people to pretty certain um, death in some of their countries. And people really do feel helpless and outraged and not sure how to um, you know, how to combat this. So at least it gave a way to speak out, to speak up. Next slide. And these are some of the stencils. No one is illegal. The stencils, um, the messages were picked by Nora, um, brainstormed with Mira. Next. Next. No one is illegal. You're all familiar with this because you have the same issues here. Next. 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 We have these two great art students of um, Nora's helping. Next. We love this, Nora, holding a proud immigrant. And it, it was pretty great to have someone who really has experienced, <coughs> has experienced the issues that were, an artist who came, who has experienced personally the issues that we we're trying to do to, to highlight. Next. This is <laughs> at the beginning of the parade the next day. I decided to march with Mira. I was also bringing a bamboo pole for uh, Julia. Next. And this is just kids getting ready for the parade. There's sort of staging time. So next, we can kind of run through these. And then they wore these great t-shirts. Next. Here's a whole family that wanted to be in the parade. Next. That suitcase is now, uh, has entered the collection of one of our Hong organizing committee members. <laughs> we just thought it was so cool. Most of the suitcases, I think, ended up being recycled back to the Salvation Army. Next. Next. And a lot of people in the parade brought their kids. Next. So here we are in the parade. There's Nora. She brought a suitcase that she had made originally for the suitcase project. Next. And suitcases, of course, are a really great metaphor for what can you bring with you? What do you have to leave behind? Um, the constant moving from place to place, the dislocation. Next. 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 What's TPS and 
DACA? Um, DACA is, was the protection of minors, um, the temporary, the ruling that a lot of people heard about the dreamers, are called the dreamers, um, kid, kids who were brought to the country with their parents illegally and had now have been living in the U.S. for their whole lives and now they're graduating high school or even going into, into college and um, Trump wants to eliminate DACA, has eliminated DACA, which was a way they could stay on a temporary basis in the country. And TPS was a, um, I believe, if I'm right, uh, a regulation that would protected people from some specific, very violent places. Um, temporary, again, a temporary protection status, say El Salvador, um, where get gang violence and so on made it clear of Haiti uh, that people were going back to, for a death sentence. And Trump also repealed that for a number of groups, like country by country. So this is the last slide. I love this slide. I love the fact that um, Mira is able to bring young people into this like very affirmative expression of their voices. And uh, that's, that's, that's it. I, I, Ken, would you let us have like a minute for a minute or two for questions, if anyone has any? Uh, yes. Correct answer. So does anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any comments? No, go ahead. You think this talk needs to go beyond here? Oh, thank you. This is the first time I've given this talk. Yeah, it. <laughs> I will share with you that Cedric does everything at the last minute. And I've been asking him. I took the pictures of the parading with his camera, so I didn't have those images. So I've been asking him for days for those. And they came last night at 2 in the morning. <laughs> Well, um, and that's a really interesting question because one of the tensions with our organizing committee is that the musicians don't get paid, and a number of the musician organizers on our on our committee felt like, well, why should we pay artists? But it's a big issue in Boston right now that artists should get paid for their work, and that artists are constantly exploited. Um, you know. It's a wonderful opportunity. You'll get so much visibility, and they get nothing. And artists have really made a political issue out of compensation. Visual artists more than musicians have, and so it's not a good time to be asking, especially activist artists, to do things for free. Um, but all I, all of these artists did these projects for very little money, basically for covering their expenses. Um, and we made it as easy as possible for them. So like for Cedric, I got the roses, got the tags printed, you know. Um, for Mira, I got as many of the two pieces. And, um, so, but we did get a grant from our State Arts Council, $2,500 grant, and we matched it with um, money from our general fundraising. So we had $5,000 basically to do this. Um, and there were a couple of other projects that I didn't show because they weren't quite as, didn't fit as well into the narrative. One of them was actually pretty amazing, but it, it didn't have quite the same, um, we brought a group of young people up from New Orleans who uh, uh, formed a, um, the only Mardi Gras Indian um, group uh, that's youth-based, and they sort of demonstrated how they make their costumes. Um, and there was also a, just a fun, like, make a city your ideal city out of recycled cardboard and, and materials. So, and somewhat kids and families were engaged in what makes a neighborhood uh, a good place and some of the gentrification issues that we're experiencing in Somerville. But mostly it was just like a free-for-all, make something cool. Um, 
yeah, so that's that's how we use those two questions. Yep. This is just a comment, but that um, those little photos of the family experiencing getting the rose and the mum crying, that is helpful. That was really it made me want to cry. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Um, I should say, though, also back to the question of compensation, as I kind of described, both of the, both the suitcase project and Cedric's project were um, supported in their development by more bigger institutions than our Honk Festival. So he was an artist in residence at Emerson. That was probably, I don't know, a ten or $20,000 stipend that he had there, as well as office space and students and so on. And Nora had a $10,000 budget to do her first big iteration of the suitcase project. So we built, you know, built on that. And that was like the research and development. And I don't know, I wouldn't have, you know, an artist couldn't have pulled off projects like that for the small amount of budget that we had. So that that's important, I think, to recognize. And um, actually, really grateful that that those artists had those bigger uh, opportunities and then we that we could offer them a platform where they would reach a whole new group of people and the work would live on and have another incarnation. So it ended up being, I think, very synergistic. All right, let's get to it. Okay. Yeah, I think we just got, I mean, honestly, this is one of the problems with public art. A lot of the time you just don't hear. But um, to the extent that we did hear was very positive, and our committee was extremely excited about it and feels really committed to um, continuing this work and has already approved its $2,500 going forward match. So, um, so I can say that. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs>